Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module. This is part of the WIT um, RHI catch-up sessions, and this particular session is our first session on pediatric TB. And we're just going to go a little bit through the background and the epidemiology of pediatric TB in South Africa. So a good place to start is with our National Department of Health that has actually brought out a TB mission statement, which says that in South Africa, uh, we aim to prevent TB and to ensure that those who do contract TB have easy access to effective, efficient and high quality diagnosis, treatment and care that reduces suffering. So let's look at the kind of children that might present in our practices. So Lerato is a five-year-old boy who's HIV positive. He's been on heart for a couple of years with a nicely suppressed viral load and his CD4 count is 250. But when you look back, you notice that he's been treated already four times in the last 18 months for lower respiratory tract infection, all in a primary healthcare basis. And now today he's back again and he's complaining of a flu um, with a cough. When we take a little bit more history, we discover that he's had this cough on and off for two years now, gets a little bit better with antibiotics, it's not particularly associated with exercise, it does seem worse at night. Um, but there's a very non-specific history on whether there's actual fevers. There's certainly no specific night sweats. Um, and although he's not been losing weight, you're concerned that his weight has stayed the same for quite some time now. TB exposure history is difficult to get, but he's an orphan living with his aunt, um, and there's no clear history um, of the cause of death of his parents. And sometimes he complains that he's tired. So when we examine Lerato, we firstly, of course, do our plotting of his growth, and we discover that he's got a Z score of minus two, which is concerning. He's been on ARVs for two years. We would expect him to have been gaining, been gaining good weight, um, and he's not gaining any weight at all at the moment. He's got a slight increase in respiratory rate, but his lung sounds pretty clear. There's no clubbing. There's no parotid enlargement, um, and actually he looks quite well, playful and interactive in the consulting room. So now, how do we take this forward? Um, and this is where we get stuck. Do we now start investigating at this point? And what investigations do we do on a five-year-old child? Uh, do we try antibiotics once more again? Should we just put this child on TB treatment? Um, or maybe something else, like LIP? It's very difficult to make a clear diagnosis of TB in children. Um, and in the next presentation, we will focus on a systematic way on how you assess a child for TB, and we would use Lerato as an example. This is a statement from Prof. Shah from Tigerberg Hospital um, that TB can go anywhere, anyhow. It's a disease of poverty, and it's a disease associated with HIV, but anyone can get TB at any age. And it's important to realize that very young babies can also get TB. But one of the concerns when we talk about TB in children is that TB actually specifically reflects what is going on with TB infection in the communities. For the source of the infection in children are usually an adult or an adolescent. Most children do not produce many bacilli and is not the cause for the spread of the disease. The World Health Organization notes a couple of things that is helpful. Firstly, that 70 to 80 percent of children with TB have pulmonary TB, and then a smaller percentage you would actually see extra pulmonary TB. And it's noticed that in high burden TB settings, that almost 20 percent of all TB cases are amongst children, and where in low burden TB settings, there's a much lower um, uh, incidence rate of TB amongst the children. If we get a little bit closer to home and look specifically in South Africa, our rate of TB in South Africa is 948 per 100,000 population. That is almost 1,000 people per 100,000 infected with TB every year. And that makes us um, a country with the third heaviest TB burden in the world. But in South Africa, children contribute 15 to 20 percent of that TB disease burden. 4% of children are annually infected with TB. That means not all of them are getting disease, but they are becoming infected. And the median age of where we see that infection becoming active disease is between 12 and 15 months. 8% of our children that present with a normal acute lower respiratory tract infection may actually already have um, confirmed TB. 
and 48% of cases culture confirmed with TB actually presented as an acute pneumonia. And that is why we always have to have a very, very high suspicion of any child coming in with a cough, whether it be um, looking like a, a community-acquired pneumonia, um, we always have to have TB in the back of our minds. In South Africa, there's additional challenges. First is that TB in children are generally underdetected and underreported. Although we're pretty good at screening adults when they arrive at the clinics, we do forget about screening children for TB. And then if a child may have TB, it's actually very difficult to confirm TB in a child. In younger children, it's very hard to get a sputum, and children don't produce bacilli um, as the adults do, and therefore we struggle to get a bacteriological confirmation. But probably the biggest problem is that the medicines that we have are complicated to give. So you have to break up tablets, you have to crush them. Um, there's quite a procedure in how we actually administer these medicines. And we don't have adequate fixed dose combinations to make it easier. And then in the world of prevention, we have a massive IPT program now in our adult population. But there is still a lot of... Um, research that needs to be done in prevention in children. Certainly the INH that we give for six months um, after TB exposure is inadequate, especially for our children with HIV. The risk of developing TB in children is also dependent on specific factors, and it's good to keep these in mind when we're assessing a child. Duration of exposure is important. So when TB is, um, as we know, a droplet infection, they are very, very small droplets. And to be able to get in enough of these TB droplets to actually um, create a TB infection, you have to spend time in a closed room with those TB bacilli for several hours, um, four to six hours, actually. And that is why when we look at TB exposure, we are looking specifically at household contacts. It will be a very different scenario for a child, for example, going to school for three or four hours, um, and is moving around in different classrooms, playing outside, does not have the same risk as a household uh, contact. It's also important to find out as much as possible about um, the person that you think is the, the, the source of the infection. Is that person AFB positive, AFB negative, culture positive, might be extra pulmonary TB, um, which makes the risk of infection lower. Intimacy of exposure depends, relates to this relationship. So, for example, a child sleeping in the bed with a mom who's got TB is at a much, much higher risk. An age of child is very useful when we are assessing children. So our highest risk for children having TB infection and then that TB infection progressing to TB disease is worst when the child is under two years old and is still a major factor right up until about the age of five. But your primary school child may very well get infected with TB but very few of them actually progress to TB disease um, unless they've got an underlying infection such as HIV or have malnutrition. Um, and so if you have a mother who has two children and the one is eight years old and the other one is two years old, maybe she's been diagnosed with TB and they're both coughing, you'll actually be much more worried about the two-year-old um, and much more relaxed about the eight-year-old. HIV state is very important. So a child who has HIV infection um, have a much higher risk of their TB infection progressing to TB disease, regardless of the age. And then malnutrition on its own is an independent factor that will also um, provide a higher risk for infection progressing to disease. But of course, in South Africa, um, it all gets complicated um, by HIV co-infection. And if you look at childhood TB cases, almost 52% Almost half of all childhood TB cases um, has also got HIV infection. And therefore, if you have a child who is a TB suspect, it's essential to also perform an HIV test. And certainly, once a child's been diagnosed with TB, you must do an HIV test. 38% of HIV-infected children in a large regional, host regional hospital were on TB treatment at the time of starting ARVs. So sometimes the way we are actually diagnosing the HIV um, is by first diagnosing the children with TB. The challenge is, is not all of these TB treatment cases were necessarily proven. And that the risk of TB disease is much higher in children with lower CD4 counts um, and also in children that are older. So in our young child and our child with a low CD4 count are at specific risk. 
The challenge is also that if the children who have HIV um, obviously have a much increased risk of developing TB disease, partly also because they have much more exposure. Their parents have HIV, TB, and has a much higher risk of developing active TB disease. Um, and if a child does have TB infection, as we've mentioned earlier, there's a much higher risk of that progressing to disease. And if it does progress to, to TB disease, it will occur much more rapidly. And there's a much higher risk of it going extrapulmonary and becoming miliary um, TB or meningeal TB. That gives a little bit of a background of TB in South Africa and some of the important um, risk factors to remember. In the next e-learning presentation, we'll be focusing on the diagnosis and in the last one specifically on TB treatment. Thank you.